Good morning. Welcome to worship today. I'm Reverend Melanie Kirk Hall, and I'm so pleased to be with you this morning. This Sunday is a special Sunday in the United Church. We celebrate the official Pride Sunday this week. We encourage you to mark this day and this month as we celebrate the lives and ministry of LGBTQIA plus and two-spirited people and all their diversity. And as we move into our time of worship this morning, we begin with the acknowledgement of the history, spirituality, culture, and stewardship of the land of the indigenous people of this region, the Anjanong First Nation. We seek to live in respect, peace, and right relations with them as we live, work, and worship upon their traditional territory. We are mindful of broken covenants and the need to strive to make right with all our relations. And in light of the Kamloops revelations, we'll be talking about more what that means for our church later in the service. And now, as we move into this time of worship, let us remember that God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. Now let us light our Christ candle. We light the Christ candle. Join with me in the call to worship. Praise the Lord with all you have. Praise and trust in the Lord with all your heart and your soul. For God is with us throughout all our lives. God's loving presence surrounds us and comforts us in times of trouble. Rejoice in the Lord at all times and in all places. For God is steadfast and loving to us all. And we'll join our hearts together in prayer for our prayer of reproach. Let us pray. Creator of the universe, you made this world in beauty, and you restore all things to glory through the loving ministry of Jesus Christ. We pray that wherever your image is still disfigured by poverty, sickness, selfishness, war, and greed, that the new creation in Jesus Christ may appear in justice, peace, and love to the glory of your name. All this we pray in your most holy name. Amen. I said at the beginning of the service it was Pride Sunday. It is also the Sunday when we remember the union and the creation of our United Church of Canada. And one of the most distinctive images of the United Church of Canada is that of our United Church crest. It's one of the quickest ways to identify if the United Church is part of something. It's our trademark and our seal. In fact, if you want to use it or, say, tattoo it on yourself, you even have to ask permission from the national office to do so. So today, in honor of our church, I want to spend some time looking at the United Church crest and what it means. It has a spiritual and historic legacy to members across this country. But how much do we know about it, I wonder? How did it come to be? What do the symbols mean? Today, we'll be using a service written by Glenda Thornton of Sanitary Queen Square United Church in St. John, New Brunswick, and we're thankful for her gift to us today for our worship. The crest is the official signature of the United Church of Canada to be placed on all documents. It was designed by Reverend Dr. Victor T. Mooney, who was the treasurer of the United Church at that time. In his own words, he said, when I was appointed the treasurer of the United Church of Canada, I discovered that the church had no seal to seal the documents of the church. Shortly after the 1925 union, the executive had ordered that a seal be designed for the new church and that a committee be appointed to look into it and make recommendations. However, no report was ever made to the executive. The committee had appointed an expert in seals and documents and several designs were made, but they had not appealed to the committee so that they were not presented. They did, however, decide they should work into it symbols that would represent the various denominations coming into union. Because I was always doodling at meetings, the then moderator, Dr. Slater, said, let's appoint Mooney the chairman of the new committee. He's always doodling. He ought to be able to work out a design. And so he did. That was in 1943, and Mooney's design was officially adopted in 1944 at the 11th General Council. We'll have our first hymn of this morning, Voices United 6. We'll have our first hymn of this morning, Voices United 469, 
we gather here. The crest is designed in the form of the St. Andrew's cross, with the insignia in each of the four corners. The X at the center represents the Greek letter chai, which is the first letter in the Greek word for Christ, Christos, the source of the English word for Christ. It is because of this that the X has become the traditional symbol for Christ. In August of 2012, at the 41st General Council, the United Church of Canada acknowledged the presence and spirituality of Aboriginal peoples in the United Church by revising the crest. The crest changes included incorporating the colors often associated with the Aboriginal medicine wheel. The medicine wheel, which reflects respect for diversity and independence, is often represented in the four traditional colors of yellow, red, black and white, which incorporate the important teachings of the four directions, the four stages of life, and the four seasons. The medicine wheel teaches us to seek balance in the physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual aspects of the circle of life. Reading John 20. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Our next hymn this morning is Voices United 336, Christ Whose Glory Fills the Sky. symbols that are on the crest are associated with the three communities that united to form the first United Church of Canada in 1925. The open Bible on the left side of the crest represents the congregational truth and its emphasis upon God's truth which makes people free. From this communion we have the hi history of liberty and prophecy, love of spiritual freedom, awareness of the creative power of the Holy Spirit, and a clear witness for civic justice. Congregationalism began back in the time of Puritan Reformation in Great Britain. Congregations that did not conform but were still Protestants and ran themselves independently and autonomously became known as Congregationalists. Congregationalism in Canada originated with the acceptance of the offer made by the British government 
that promised free land to New Englanders who would relocate to Nova Scotia. In 1759, several hundred immigrants founded new towns and gathered in churches. The first was in Chester, Nova Scotia. In 1760, a colony began in Maugerville, New Brunswick, with their first church being organized six years later. The churches in Newfoundland were organized in 1846. In 1801, the British Congregationalists sent a missionary to organize the churches in Quebec. That beginning led to the formation of the Congregational Union of Ontario and Quebec, which merged with the older Atlantic Group in 1906. It was that union of congregational churches that joined the United Church of Canada in 1925. Our responsive psalm this morning is Psalm 68, found in Voices United 787. Arise, O God, and let your enemies be scattered. Let those who hate you flee before you. Like drifting smoke, disperse them. Like wax melting in the fire. Let the wicked perish at your presence, O God. But let the righteous be glad and exalt before you. Let them rejoice with exceeding joy. Sing praises to God, God's holy name. Make a highway for the one who rides the clouds. Be joyful and exult in God's presence. Guardian of orphans, protector of widows, O God, in your holy dwelling. You give the lonely a home in which to live. You lead the prisoners out to prosperity. But the rebels must live in a wasteland. When you went out at the head of your people, when you marched through the wilderness, the earth quaked, the heavens poured down rain. Before you, God of Sinai, God of Israel. You sent down a generous rain. You refreshed your heritage when it languished. There your people found a home, which in your goodness you provided for the poor. Sing to God, dominions of earth. Praise the one who has dominion. The one who rides through the heavens even the primal heavens, the one whose voice is the th mighty thunder. Acknowledge the power that is God's, whose majesty is over Israel, whose strength is in the skies. You are awesome, O God, as you have your sanctuary, bringing power and strength to your people. Blessed are you, God of Israel. Blessed are you. Our next hymn this morning is Voices United 402, We Are One. dove at the top of the crest symbolizes the Holy Spirit, whose transforming power has been a distinctive mark of Methodism. Here, our heritage is one of evangelical zeal, concern for human redemption, warmth of Christian fellowship, testimony of spiritual experience, and the ministry of sacred song. The Methodist movement traces its origins to the evangelical awakening in the 18th century in Great Britain. 
Methodism followed the work of John Wesley, who was an Anglican clergyman. Methodism in Canada is traced to Lawrence Coughlin, an Irish Methodist preacher who came to Newfoundland in 1765. Around the same time, Methodists were migrating from England to Nova Scotia. Among them was William Black Sr., whose young, whose young son of 19 organized Methodist classes in 1781. Three years later, Black journeyed to Baltimore, Maryland for a meeting to organize the new Methodist Episcopal Church. The Canadian work that Black had developed was taken under their care and prospered as an integral part of the Methodist Episcopal Church until 1828, when it became separate and independent. Meanwhile, the Methodists from Great Britain had migrated to the Upper Canada area and brought with them several divisions of British Methodism. Mergers in 1874 and 1884 resulted in the Methodist Church of Canada being formed, and this was the church that joined the United Church in 1925. Reading Matthew. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, people went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And the voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Our next hymn this morning is Voices United 333, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling, which was written by Methodist Charles Wesley, John Wesley's brother. Part of our faithful response is the giving of our offering, tokens of our time, of our money, of our lives. In this time, the church still continues even though it looks very different than what it did before. Your offerings are essential to help that ministry continue. Information about how you can give will be on the screen. And so now we give what we can for the work of God's kingdom come here and now. Let us pray. Loving God, open us to a new world where there is no longer least and greatest, rich and poor, haves and have-nots. 
a world where all are treated as beloved, precious children. Until that day comes, bless our small contributions of time, talent, and treasures, and may it work towards the building of your new world. Amen. The burning bush on the right side of the crest is a symbol of Presbyterianism and the indestructibility of the church. From the Presbyterians, we have received a heritage of high regard for the dignity of worship, the education of all people, the authority of scripture, and the church as the body of Christ. A form of Calvinism, Presbyterianism, traces its roots back to the Scottish Reformation, Scotland's formal break from the Roman Catholic Church in 1560. Later in 1598 in France, the Edict of Nantes was issued by Henry V, the fourth, to grant Calvinist Protestants of France, also called the Huguenots, substantial rights in a nation still considered essentially Catholic. French Huguenots escaping persecution following the revocation of this edict in 1685 brought the reformed faith to Canada. But even in the new world, their growth and development were restricted. After Britain took over in Nova Scotia in 1713, subsequent immigration of the Presbyterians from Scotland and Ireland completely overwhelmed the small French contingent. The first ministers from Scotland were Daniel Cook, David Smith, and Hugh Graham, who organized the Presbytery of Turo in 1786. In 1795, the Presbytery of Pictou was organized, which represented another faction of Scottish Presbyterians. In 1817, these two groups joined by a few ministers of the established Church of Scotland, were able to come together and form the Synod of the Presbyterian Church of Nova Scotia. Meanwhile, Presbyterians were moving into central and western Canada as well. As in the east, they brought many divisions of the Scottish Church with them and established several presbyteries, and then synods, and then the first being the Presbytery of Canada in 1818. The establishment of new synods continued through the first half of the 19th century, in part due to importing divisions within the Church of Scotland, the arrival of non-English speaking immigrants, such as the Dutch Reformed, and the opening of new territories in the West. In 1875, a series of mergers led to the union of most of the Presbyterians into the Presbyterian Church of Canada. 70% of the congregations in that denomination joined the United Church of Canada in 1925. Reading Acts. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and the cloud hid them from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go, to, go into heaven. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the sky. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. 
It's impossible to celebrate this united church of ours without also naming the terrible legacy that is also ours. Until 1969, the United Church of Canada was involved with Canada's Indian residential school system. During the 19th and early 20th century, federal policies were undergirded by a conviction that the First Peoples needed to be assimilated into Western European culture. Children were removed from their families and communities and forced to attend residential schools. By discouraging the indigenous languages and cultural practices, the schools played an important role in carrying out this national policy of assimilation. The United Church inherited involvement from its founding denominations of Methodist and Presbyterian churches. With rare exceptions, the national policy of assimilation was not questioned by the churches. This uncritical approach to mission enabled the church to become agents of the government in promoting the schools. Between 1849 and 1925, the Methodists and Presbyterians operated a number of schools. In 1925, at the time of church union, the United Church assumed responsibility for 12 schools, of which the last one closed in 1969. The United Church also operated two residences where children from out of community attended day schools. In total, the Roman Catholic, Anglican, Presbyterian, and United Churches operated some 130 residential schools across Canada. The United Church of Canada was involved in the following Indian residential schools. In British Columbia, Asuhat, Aberni, Port Simpson, Kualakiza, in Alberta, Edmonton and Morley, in Saskatchewan, Round Lake and File Hills, in Manitoba, Norway House, Brandon, Portage La Prairie, and in Ontario, Mount Elgin, Muncie. Of the approximate 80,000 students still alive today, about 10% attended United Church run schools. As the school system evolved, it was the federal government that set the standards and provided the funding, which was often inadequate and legally required the children to attend. The church was involved in suggesting to the government potential principals for the schools and also hiring other staff. The name of the United Church of Canada was integral to the identity of the schools, and aside from a few voices rarely heard by those in power, it gave unquestioned assent to the policy of assimilation that informed the school system. In the past 35 years, the United Church has begun a directed prayerful and concerted effort to become more informed and responsive to the harmful effects of the residential school on the Indigenous people and culture. In 1986, the first apology was issued to the Indigenous people for the church's part in their colonization. In 1998, the church offered a specific formal apology to formal students, families, and communities. And in an amazing sign of grace, that the spirit is working amongst us, it has been with outstretched hands by many indigenous people that the offer of healing has been accepted. The journey towards reconciliation requires a long-term commitment. Initial steps have included the church's healing fund, its participation in claims uh, in the settlement process, advocacy for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and a collaboration with the historic Indian Residential Sc School Settlement Agreement archival research, and increased resources for reconciliation and right work. But we must do more. The revelation at Kamloops reminds us that the work is not done. Today I want to pray the words that our moderator offered in light of these horrible revelations and our legacy involved with them. Let us pray. O oh God, we are grieving. O oh God, we are shocked. O oh God, we are horrified. But God, if we truly listened, we can't be surprised. The elders and the communities had already told us, had already told the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, told the government and the world the stories of the children, dead and buried, unnoted by the settler systems, but never forgotten by their siblings, their parents, their communities. We grieve for the indigenous children taken from their homes by parents and their parents by the government, handed over to the responsibility of the Christian church. We pray for the children never return to their communities, not only the 215 children that we are hearing about from Kamloops, but to those who are unfound, 
whose bodies have not been found yet, who died in any of the Indian residential schools. We grieve for the survivors of the Indian residential schools, the children who did not come home, but who were changed by their experience, who grew up and have trauma of remembering again what happened to them. Even as we give thanks for their families and their communities who hold the stories of the children, who have kept searching, who keep searching, we grieve that the search was even necessary, that even one child was taken, that even one child died, that even one child's death went unnoted by the system. Help us to stop, to sit in silence, to remember the names that we do not know. May their spirits have peace and their bodies be brought, brought back to their lands. And God, help us to take this grief, this shock, this horror, and to turn it into right action. Actions that work for right relations. Action that makes healing, justice, and hope happen. And please, don't let those of us who are settlers and descendants of settlers, and newcomers to this land, let the horror, the shock, and the grief be just an outpouring of words, or tears, or ineffectual hand-wringing. Let this be a moment that changes a moment that transforms the brokenness that we might walk in right relations for the good of your children, for the good of your world. Please, God, we pray these things in the name of the one who brought creation into being, in the name of Jesus, our teacher and our friend, in the name of the Holy Spirit, whose wings spread across the sky. Amen and amen. The symbols of Alpha and Omega in the lower quarter of the crest are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. These symbolize the eternal nature of our living God, the fullness of creation. Reading Revelation. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also, he said, write this. For these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. Those who conquer will inherit these things, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. Our next hymn this morning is Voices United 567, Will You Come and Follow Me? The oval shape of the crest is derived from the outline of a fish, the symbol used to identify early Christians. The fish was depicted as a Christian symbol in the first decades of the second century. The symbol itself may have been suggested by the miraculous multiplication of loaves and fishes or the meal of the seven disciples after the resurrection on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. Reading from Luke. Once, while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret, and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down 
and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long but have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. Peter and all who were with them were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. Our next hymn is Voices United 884, You Shall Go Out With Joy. The Latin words, et omnes unum sinct, found on the lower left side of the outline, mean that all may be one, and are taken from John 17, 21. I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. As you, God, are in me, and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. On the lower right side, we find the Mohawk phrase, agawe na de de wa na ren, which means all my relations. And I apologize if I butchered that pronunciation. This phrase connects with Jesus' power, prayerful reflection. This phrase connects with Jesus' prayer and reflects the spirituality of the indigenous people that acknowledges our interrelationship with all of creation. With these words, we are reminded that we are both a united and uniting church. Our Uniting Church of Canada is the largest Protestant denomination in the country. It was the first union of churches in the world to cross historical interdenominational lines. Along with the Congregational Church, the Methodists, and the Presbyterians, the General Council of the Union Churches from, the Western, uh, from Western Canada also joined in 1925. Since then, the Synod of the Wesleyan Methodist Church of Bermuda and the Canadian Conference of the Evangelical United Brethren Church have also become part of the United Church of Canada. In 2015 and in 2019, the United Church entered into full communion with both the United Church of Christ USA and the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. Known as the Full Communion Agreement, it allows clergy to move freely between the denominations if they choose and recognizes each other's sacraments and baptisms and communion. As you can see, united and uniting is still well and alive and unfolding within our church. We also celebrate that as a denomination, we seek right relationship among all people and with creation itself. Our crest not only reflects the history of our country, but reveals that we have come from various faiths, different and dissenting perhaps, but all believing in one God, one Lord Jesus Christ, and one Holy Spirit. And so we celebrate this evolving and changing church. We give thanks for its place in our lives and the way in which we are called to serve and be served within it. Happy birthday, United Church of Canada. Thanks be to God. And now, in the power of the Holy Spirit, we go forth into the world to fulfill our calling as the people of God, the body of Christ in the world. Go in peace, knowing that nothing can separate you from the love of God 
And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ rest upon you, the love of God embrace you, and the presence of the Holy Spirit surprise and encourage you this day and evermore. Amen. <laughs> Hold you in her love and hold you in.